Well, thank you everybody for joining us. We are excited to be here. I pulled and drug and begged and pleaded my buddy Christine to join me. Uh, so she's back with us. He didn't have to, to plead too much for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to, to be here in the new year and uh, to be presenting with Wayne and talking about transition services. So we got some name changes here on this first slide. You'll see AVERTAC is still the same, but Christine, will you introduce uh, yourself under the new program? Sure. Um, I'm Christine Johnson. For those of you um, that don't know me, I am uh, part of a team at George Washington University. And uh, I am now um, with the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the collaborative. Um, this is a new uh, grant. The, um, there's always been, uh, for the last, uh, I think, 10 years at least, there's been a National Technical Assistance Center on Transition. Um, but now, uh, when they recompeted the grant, um, it is now uh, a cooperative agreement uh, between the Office of Special Education Programs and the Rehabilitation RSA, Rehabilitation Services Administration. Um, the purpose of the NTACT, uh, the collaborative, is to build the capacity uh, from the state education agencies and vocational rehabilitation agencies um, to help improve graduation rates and post-school education, employment and community integration of outcomes for students and youth with disabilities. So um, I, I formally was with the WINTAC, which was the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Grant um, Technical Assistance Center. And again, uh, myself and my, my coworkers through George Washington University, we uh, focus on uh, the provision of pre-employment transition services um, to students with disabilities. So. We're very excited now to have uh, the new NTACT, the collaborative, um, so that we are going to actually, as technical assistance providers, kind of show everyone we're, we're collaborating. So that's kind of the message that we want um, state agent, VR agencies, tribal agencies, education to take away is that um, we're going to work together in partnership to provide services for students and youth with disabilities. All right, thank you, Christine. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this slide 100 times. I'm not gonna go in depth. If you have questions, please throw them in the chat box, put your name in there. John covered a lot of this already. Um, with the virtual stuff, the speakers kick on and off and it's hard to hear each other when we talk over one another. So if yeah, you know, somebody's talking, kind of give them a minute to breathe. We've also gotten gotten a lot better at this. We used to talk over each other all the time during the presentations, but now we're starting to recognize that space. All right. So Christine already introduced herself, so I'll jump in here. Most of you guys know me already. I'm Wayne Daigle with the, the co-director co of AVERTAC. And today we're going to be covering uh, tribal youth transition services. Now, the, the reason we, we're doing a collaborative approach here is, is I continued to um, get a lot of questions about the definition of what transition services are versus pre-employment transition services. And we want to help clear that up a little bit. So that... Is, is, is the point of today's presentation or webinar. We wanna, we wanna really define the roles of each uh, agency, the state, which is why Christine's joining us, and AVERS, which is, is AVERTAC. Uh, and please, as we go through this, interrupt us. You know, you know, raise your hand on the, on the, on the chat box. Um, and what's the, what's the phone number? Star. If you're on the phone, you can dial star six to unmute yourself and mute yourself. Star nine raises your hand so we can see that you wish to share if you're on the phone. Thank you, Nick. 
I never remember the star stuff because <laughs> I'm not a shining star. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just real brief uh, background. Um, AverTAC has three levels of uh, training or technical assistance. And the first level is the intensive technical assistance, which is ITA, and that's the face-to-face -face, uh, training uh, platform. And that's where we really dig into uh, some of the programmatic infrastructure of the VR process and help you uh, realign your process and your um, steps with the VR process. We take a look at case files and help you determine if you're documenting the correct stuff and that type of thing. The second level is targeted, and that's uh, more specific to specific, you know, items that are needs of the program. So it might be one or two that we look at and help address. And that is also uh, part of the webinar series that we do. That's more of a targeted approach. So it's not uh, so intensive one-on-one -on -one type uh, uh, technical assistance. And then the third one is universal, and that's our uh, website where it's self-guided. We have some modules on there that you can look at. Uh, all the webinars are, are housed on the website. So that's more of the open self-guided approach to the, the universal target uh, technical assistance. And Currently, I, go ahead, Christine. No, go ahead, I'll, go ahead. <laughs> so, Currently, we are serving um, 20, oh, hold on, I lost the number. 25 states. Right, we're serving 25 states, thank you. Um, there's 86 AVERS programs across the 25 states and roughly because of some of the tribes being in uh, together, we're serving right around 120 tribes at this point. All right, Christine. Um, I was just going to say that um, just as Wayne explained about <laughs> universal targeted and um, intensive, um, that is a, the charge also for the um, intact, the collaborative. Um, so we work with um, the state agencies, um, state education agencies, and uh, just helping to um, improve uh, employment and transition services, dropout prevention interventions, um, engagement in career and technical education. Uh, we focus too on interagency collaboration and basically just other education and VR transition services for all students and youth with disabilities. So um, again, uh, we'll probably share more as we go through this webinar. And uh, we do have a slide with some of our uh, website resources um, at, at the end there. So um, as Wayne said, please don't be shy, ask questions as we go along because this is really a, it's not just a talking head here uh, giving you some information. We really wanna have a conversation. All right. All right, so our webinar objectives, we wanna distinguish between roles and capabilities of the AVERS program and state VR agencies regarding pre-employment transition services. We also want to look at uh, how we're gonna be describing the processes for pre preparing viable plans to identify allowable and appropriate transition services for tribal youth with disabilities. We're gonna be looking at providing and discussing strategies for maximizing efficiency and using resources to provide those transition services for the tribal youth and identifying benefits and barriers to collaboration and achieving the common purpose of serving tribal youth with disabilities who reside on or near the tribal services area. So that really is the, the meat and potatoes of what we're doing today. We wanna to make sure that we get all of these ob objectives ad addressed. So uh, again, as we go through this, let's make this interactive and ask questions, please. Christine and I don't like to listen to each other talk very much. <laughs> That's All right, Christine, it's yours. <laughs> All right, thanks, Wayne. Um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, uh, this law was taken effect uh, July 22nd, 2014, added the requirement for the state VR program to now provide pre-employment transition services to students with disabilities. So with the addition of the five required pre-employment transition services, 
uh, the VR program can now be characterized as providing a continuum of services um, that includes pre-employment transition services followed by transition services and employment related services. So that's the graphic on this slide um, kind of shows that. So beginning with pre-employment transition services or pre ads as many people often um, refer to it. Um, if you were on an earlier uh, presentation that we did last year, <laughs> uh, you know that pre ads are the earliest set of services uh, that the, v the state VR program can provide for either potentially eligible or eligible students with disabilities. Uh, they're short-term in nature and they help to uh, identify career interest. So again, they are a specific set of five required activities. These are provided directly to students with disabilities. And it also has the caveat for the state VR agencies to set aside and reserve a minimum of 15% of their federal grant allotment in order to provide pre-employment transition services. So these five required pre at services start to lay the foundation for the next layer here, which is the transition services. And that's, uh, again, the next set of services on this continuum of VR services that are available to eligible individuals. So transition services, uh, the, the individual has to be eligible for vocational rehabilitation. Uh, transition services provide for further development and pursuit of career interest, whether it's through post-secondary education, um, vocational training, job search, placement and retention, follow up and follow along services. And then as we go through the continuum, the next layer is the employment related services. So again, these are uh, typically provided once an eligible student with a disability has identified their career interest. Uh, they further developed and pursued those interests, maybe through uh, post-secondary education and vocational training that can be provided through transition services and they decided they're pursuing a very specific employment outcome that's on their IPE, their individual plan for employment. So the employment related services are designed to assist in preparing for uh, securing and retaining um, uh, the uh, individual's uh, employment outcome. And again, it's done consistent with their unique strengths, resources, priorities, concerns, abilities, capabilities, interest, and informed choice uh, that you'll find in section 103A of the Rehab Rehabilitation Act and 34 CFR 361.48B of the state VR regulations. So again, this, um, I, I think now with the passage of WIOA, um, for the state VR programs, you now, for the first time ever, state VR programs are serving more individuals under the age of 25 than they're serving adults. And that's because of the, the uh, provision uh, and requirement for pre-employment transition services. So we're, again, that type of service is a, only available through the state VR program and then followed by transition and employment related services. So we're gonna talk more about um, how the AVERS program and the state VR program, uh, along with other partners can work together in serving students with disabilities. So uh, next slide. All right. So transition, um, this comes out of our uh, American Indian VR uh, service program, uh, the 34 CFR 371.6. The definition um, is a coordinated set of activities for a student or youth with a disability. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? A lot of the language is, is 
pretty close to the 361 regulations, but this is specifically for the AVERS program. This is what guides us in the delivery of those services. So we're gonna, we're gonna re refer to this throughout the presentation. Um, again, AVERTAC and Christine are not interpreting these regulations. We're just providing it as a basis of uh, reference. So as we go through this, it, it's just what, what Christine talked about earlier. It's designed within an outcome oriented process that promotes movement from school to post-school activities. So I really don't want to read this word for word. So I'm going to kind of summarize it a little bit for you. Good idea. Yeah, because it's just, it's regulation and it's, you guys would all be taking a nap by the time we got done with the first two slides. So um, really it covers everything that, that was identified in the, in the previous slide. Anything post-secondary education, uh, voc, voc training, uh, in, integrated competitive community employment. If we have long-term follow-along support from a, an approved uh, provider, we do su the supported employment. We don't see that a lot in the AVERS world because we don't have that funding source uh, available to us like the states do. Continuing in adult education, um, just on and on along that same path. Pretty much anything that we can provide post-education or post-primary education. Um, or secondary education, sorry. It's, it has to be based on the individual student or youth needs. And it, we gotta look at the grade eight. Again, everything we do in the VR process, we have to take into account the grade eight. And uh, this defines what we look at. So again, I'm not, I don't wanna go through it word for word. If you have questions, please put it in the box. And then now what you see is um, the state vocational rehabilitation um, services program uh, as defined uh, the definition for transition services defined at uh, 34 CFR 361.5 C55. And I'm not going to read this either, but you can, <laughs> if you take the two slides, um, I think you're going to find that maybe there's maybe three words that differ. I mean, these are mirror um, definitions. So we, sh we have to show this to you because, again, it is the same foundation for serving students and youth, whether it's the AVERS program or it's the state VR program. Same definition. It's the same message. Um, you know, that's why we're going to be talking today about this collaboration um, between our programs so that we can achieve that common purpose of serving um, tribal um, youth with disabilities um, to achieve the outcomes um, that they are wanting to achieve. All right. So let's look at pre-employment transition services. Um, they are designed to help early career exploration. They assist a student with a disability to identify their career interest. Um, and then, which can be further explored through additional vocational rehabilitation uh, program services, such as transition services and other individualized VR services and, and employment outcomes. So back to that continuum, Priets are the, the early start. Um, and research has shown that early career exploration through pre-employment transition services increases the likelihood that that student and youth will have, be able to achieve a higher quality, competitive integrated employment. Um, so it's a way for students to start to formulate goals um, talk about their dreams and, and what they want to do and look at their options uh, for their future after high school. So now, Wayne, I, I have a question for you. Um, I, I know you weren't expecting this, but I have to ask. Tell me, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? Well, I'm thinking that it's uh, one bite at a time. Very good. Exactly. So as Wayne knows, this elephant is huge. 
you've got it in front of you, what do you do? You just start with one bite at a time. And that is the same analogy that I wanna use for pre-employment transition services. It's small bites. Um, starting you know, early and often, it allows a student to gain exposure to the world of work. Uh, to, it allows them to try out or, or even you know, look at what career interest they may have. It can spark their motivation and their passion. Um, it'll increase their confidence and self-esteem. So, you know, all of this is really necessary um, for students and youth to gain workplace um, knowledge um, so that they can embrace and, and then pursue whatever post-secondary um, outcomes they want when they leave high school. So again, it's um, allowing those small bites they can taste it, they can say, hmm, I thought I wanted to work in, um, you know, with, with animals. And now I'm like, I don't think so. I want to do something different. It allows them to have that process to, to find out what they want to do. So Christine, I got a question for you now. Okay. Um, one of the things that we hear thrown around all the time in the VR process is they have to be a certain age. When we start talking about pre-employment transition services, what age does that start with uh, for those youth? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's going to vary um, between state agencies, and you ask why. the The law says that it's, you know, it, it's basically the age um, that. For IDEA um, services for that student that your state education agency defines. So let's just say uh, for generally most states um, make it so that you, you're serving at least starting at age 16. But we have found um, throughout the United States and the territories that most agents, state VR agencies are starting to provide the pre-employment transition services at age 14. And that's because uh, the law allows you to go below the, the minimum age for IDEA um, if, you, if you choose to. So they, again, it'll vary from state to state. I, I will tell you, Michigan is a state um, that starts, it goes all the way up to age 26 in that particular state. Most states go up into the age of, uh, let's say 21. Generally, you're gonna say 16 to 21, but it'll vary. So um, you'd have to check with your state VR agency to find out what's, what age they start with. Thank you. And that's for pre-employment transition services. Okay. So then we get to transition so we have service. Some, uh, Go questions. ahead, Jamie. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Wayne. Uh, we had some posts in the chat box, and I thought you might want to look over there at those. OK, so we got, oh, we got some answers um, coming into the questions. So 14 to 21 uh, years, 16 to 24, uh, 14. Rachel, you asked, what assessments do other programs use for their youth to begin exploring interests and strengths? Are there suggested free ones online that are self-directed, easy to interpret? To go through a vocal with the state waiting list is about four to six weeks at this time. Plus many don't wanna do one person with COVID-19. Um, yeah, so if you guys have, to this question, the assessments, please uh, put it in the chat box or unmute yourself and, and let us know what assessments you're using in your area. Um, I'd like to, uh, I see that um, Tamara uh, Patterson has, has uh, posted in the chat that um, the, the law, WIOA, has defined youth um, as age uh, 16 to 24. I believe you're gonna find um, for this, 
purpose of talking about pre-employment transition services. Pre-employment transition services um, only apply to students with disabilities. So um, youth are separate. Um, let's, so if all of us on this webinar are youth, then that's because we're between, let's say the ages of 14 and 24, 14 or 16 and 24. But a subset of us are in school, so we're students. And we may be, let's say, 14 to 21. So pre-employment transition services are only available to students with disabilities, and it's only provided through the state VR program. So um, it's true that youth with disabilities are certainly eligible for transition services. Um, so I, I wanted to just make that clarification. Transition services are available with whether it's the AVERS program or, or the state VR program uh, to students and youth. And so in the transition um, services, that's the first line, right? It's provided by the school and with state VR and tribal VR. And when we talk about transition services versus pre-employment transition services, this is a, a great discussion and thanks for going into that a little bit, um, Christine. We start looking at some different parameters. So when we look under the, the transition services, the defining definition or the defining moment for AVERS programs is centered around working age, youth. So what's legal in your area for that youth to be working in the community? And in some states it's 14, some states it's 15, and some states it's 16. That's where that transition allowable service provision comes into play for AVERS programs. So in Montana, working age is 16. So we start, the AVERS programs in Montana can start providing transition services to 16 year old youth who have disabilities and are requiring that service to transition from from that school to whatever they're, you know, they're, they're wanting to go into, whether it's post-secondary education, vocational training, on-the-job training, um, just competitive employment, job searching, that type of thing. You want to add anything to that, Christine? Um, I'm sorry, I was actually looking at something in the chat and I'm uh, getting confused. At my age, I, I tend to get confused. <laughs> here. So, um, yes, uh, the transition services can be provided, whether it's by the school, whether it's the VR program or tribal VR. Um, and no matter what, services have to be coordinated, um, especially between, you know, VR and education because you really should not have any duplication or supplanting. Um, under the state VR program regulations, um, and it's under Title I of the Rehabilitation Act, you know, uh, nothing can be construed as reducing that local education agency or any other agency's obligation under IDEA, um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, to provide or pay for transition services that are also considered special education or related services and necessary for that free appropriate public education for children with disabilities. So um, I think that it, what, they're, what they're just saying is, hey, everybody talk to each other. Um, we, if it's an education service, education pays for it. If it's a VR, or employment related service, VR pays for it. Um, that, and that you, it, how do you know? Well, you sit down and you discuss with your local education agency. It involves that collaboration and partnership and conversation. Um, I, I wanted to address um, this chat message that um, is in here uh, from Anita um, and she's, uh, I guess when this is uh, when the students are physically in school, um, that there's a lot of 
uh, confusion um, with the disruption of uh, classroom instruction uh, by taking students out of class. And I will tell you, Anita, that this is exactly the reason, and we're gonna talk about it in some continuing slides here, uh, the need for that interagency um, agreement that has to occur between the education and VR about how you provide services. Uh, so again, you know, it, pre-employment transition services can happen during the school day, if that works. If not, it can happen after school. Um, it can happen anywhere. It can happen in a library, if you're doing it face-to-face, -face, it happens in a Zoom room, if you're providing uh, virtual instruction. So, but it means talking to each other. Um, I know if, if you're a parent of a, a student with a disability, you know it's very critical that your, your son or daughter um, gets their education, right? Uh, they've got special programming that has to occur. And, you know, you don't want them pulled out for something else that's going to delay their progress. So that's, um, and I don't think the school and the teachers, everyone has to be on the same page uh, because again, pre-employment transition services should actually, again, be that early start. It's helping to support these students as they continue their transition and heading towards graduation because the goal is to help them uh, be prepared for those post-secondary outcomes um, once they leave school. So I think you'll, we'll talk about it and it's probably we'll come up with even another webinar to specifically um, talk just about that uh, kind of collaboration that happens. But the, when she, she asked if there's funds set aside to train school staff on what and how these services are and how they complement education. And that's a great question. Yes, state VR agencies, when I mentioned on the earlier slide that one of the requirements is that they set aside a minimum of 15% of their federal allotment to provide pre-employment transition services. One option is that if they've made these available to all students with disabilities within the state, and then the state agency has funds remaining, they can do what's called authorization or uh, authorized services. Uh, those would be kind of overarching, like you wanna get your uh, teachers and special educators in the same room with VR staff or, and maybe with tribal staff, and you're all gonna have a training on what are these services? How do we work together? So that's, yes, it's, um, it requires some strategic planning and uh, fiscal forecasting on a state VR agency's part, but that can happen. And that's the other part of this, um, what you were just talking about, Christine, is, is the schools are under different regulations than VR, state VR and AVERS program. So it also is a, the, the meeting of the minds in that sense of how how to like idea idea how does that come into play when we are under the rehab act and and what service provision we can provide versus what idea can provide so it, it really that's where that back and forth comes into play so age age categories might be different under each guiding uh, regulation and again that's the collaborative part of working together. Lee asked a question, um, what is a recommended for, what is a recommended process for an AVERS program to partner with the state pre to provide allowable AVERS transition services and access uh, to pre for eligible tribal youth without duplication of services? And Christy and I are gonna get into that a little more in depth in the upcoming slides, but that, what what she was speaking of just a few minutes ago about the communication that's where you start you have to develop that rapport between the state vr and the tribal vr programs to to establish that connection and that understanding of of service provision and in our previous webinar that we hosted on this topic we had um 
two states, Wisconsin and Washington State, and two AVERS programs from those states on a panel um, that showed, and they talked very openly about how they developed their relationships and how they developed the process in the service of those uh, provision or provision of services. So uh, we can definitely, I encourage everybody to go back and watch that if they have questions on how to develop that relationship. We'll get in, we'll touch on that a little bit later in the, in the presentation today. Um, we have another question in here. Can you still be a student, but are differentiated from a student with a disability because they're not under an IEP or are not, and are not in special education? So there's a couple things that happen with that. Um, when we start talking about becoming eligible for the voc rehab system, they have to meet the criteria, the five, the six criteria, excuse me, that are standard for everybody. There has to be a diagnosed disability. Um, and that's kind of the start of our VR process. Now, this, this area would fall back onto the school. And uh, anytime, Christine, you wanna jump in and correct me, please do. This, this type of situation falls back onto the school because the school is the one that has the defining or the, the um, labeling power, so to speak, or the diagnosing power. They can send the kiddo out for, or the youth out for uh, an assessment, uh, recommend an assessment. There's a bunch of uh, classroom evaluations that can take place that provide that, that documentation and foundation for that initial referral to diagnose the, the youth. Um, one thing under AVERS programs or state voc rehab is that we, we, uh, we can provide services under an IEP within special education, but we also look at the 504 plans because those are not specific to learning disabilities. Those, can, those are the uh, more sometimes like ADHD type diagnoses, the, the physical diagnoses that take place that interrupt the learning um, or development process. So if they aren't under an IEP, it doesn't mean that they automatically are not eligible for services. Um, and if they're, if they're not engaged in special education services, maybe there's something else going on that you can talk to the school about and talk to the teachers about and see if they have any of that supporting documentation to help with that referral process. So really what I see as our trans, in our transition services, we also have a huge advocate uh, position that we fill within this, within this, this communities that we serve. Because a lot of our, our uh, parents don't know about these services. Um, and, and quite honestly, some of the, the schools that we, we, we serve in the, in the, on the service areas for AVERS programs aren't up to speed on some of this stuff. So they, they also, we need to help them understand. And I'm really trying to tread lightly here so I don't say bad stuff. Well, no, you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right, Wayne. Um, you know, it's a lot of, um, whether it's the education system or the VR system, the AVERS program, it's struggling to understand everyone's definitions and what we do. Um, so it, it's a constant um, kind of education and, and communication because, you know, teachers change. Um, <laughs> you know, the teacher that was there last year is not the same one that's there this year, the principal, um, the same with counselors, you know, people take other positions, they leave the agency. Um, I, I did want to just point out that for the definition of a student with a disability um, under the um, WIOA is that this is, this is what uh, the definition is for the student. It is an individual with a disability. They are in a secondary, post-secondary or other recognized education program. So they could be homeschooled or in a maybe a juvenile justice um, type of education program. Um, but that student, that individual is not younger than the earliest age for the provision of transition services under um, section uh, 614 blah 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 of uh, IDEA. 
<laughs> Unless the state elects a lower minimum age for the receipt of pre-employment services. And so I talked about that, right? I said that, you know, generally in most states, um, IDEA um, in your state education will say, you know, maybe starts at 16. So if the state VR agency wants to serve, say, a 14-year-old, then they just have to agree, yeah, we're going to serve kids that are 14. So in other words, a student with a disability meets a, an age range. So not younger than the earliest age uh, for, for um, IDEA services, unless they want to go lower. And they're not older than 21. And again, unless the individual state law provides for a higher maximum age uh, for receipt of services under IDEA. And I mentioned um, Michigan as being one that goes up to 26. So they, they're in, this is a individual in school or some kind of post-secondary secondary or recognized education program. They meet, they're in the age range and they are an individual with a disability uh, for purposes of Section 504, or they're eligible for receiving special education or related services under Part B of IDEA. So a youth, if they're not in a recognized education program, um, they can get transition services through the state VR program. They're just not going to get the uh, pre-employment transition services that's available only to students with disabilities. And I probably have confused people, um, but that's, that's okay. But so this whole topic's confusing, so it's okay. That's yep. why we're doing this uh, webinar again. Um, okay, so what about this slide we're on, Christine? Are you ready or? I'm, I'm ready, go, go forth. All right. Okay, so, you know, this is exactly what um, Wayne was mentioning that um, when we're talking about transition services, any allowable VR service under um, section, uh, I'm stumbling here because I somehow just managed to, ex excuse me, I, I made the chat box really large and it covered up the whole <laughs> <laughs> technical technical I difficulties. <laughs> I can't do two things at once. Um, but under Section 103A of the Rehabilitation Act, 361.48B, and of course under the AVERS um, regulations of 371.6, any allowable VR service can be provided as a transition service under an IPE. Wayne, what would you say the 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 uh, the difference here is so um, between state pre-ets and trans Avers transition. Uh, well, I, I guess just when we're looking at tr um, transition services, because they, I'm like transition services, huh? What do you mean any available, okay. any allowable VR service? Is it so? Some examples I have is is we've had. Um, students that wanted to we we're working with a, a senior and that individual wanted to work with uh, fish and game they wanted to be out with uh, wildlife and so the the fish and game department for the tribe we did a we did an assessment or work experience with them uh, where they went in and did some job shadowing type stuff and got to go out and 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 work with them in the field and the student came back and said that didn't really fulfill their their need or their their information they didn't gather enough information to make a decision so they wanted to go to the state fish and game department about 100 miles away so one of the services that we set up with them was through the job shadowing but it was also uh transportation costs to get back and forth from their house to 100 miles away and, and home so it was a 200 mile round trip and so we had transportation, we had job shadowing, we had um, um, and then just counseling and guidance developed under the IPE to provide those services. So that's an example of allowable services that because the, the youth was still in school, still a student, 
it fell under the transition service category instead of just services. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Christine? Sure. You know, um, again, kind of to sum it up, the, the, art, the transition services, they facilitate transition from school to whatever, um, whatever the student's going to do once they, they leave um, that secondary um, education uh, program. So whether it's going to work, whether it's going to training, um, further education, transition service have to be provided to that student or youth who have been determined eligible for the VR program and, in the, and it's on their approved IPE. And as Wayne gave some examples, I think the difference here is when you look at uh, the third bullet of some of these services that include, but aren't limited to, you know, assessment, counseling and guidance, transportation. These are services that we provide traditionally always to our adult population, right? The difference here is the, the individual that's receiving these services. So when they are um, a youth, a student, they are called transition services. Um, as opposed to an adult who may be getting the same service. And I, right. again, I think it's the who's receiving the service. Um, because uh, like Wayne said, what are, what are these transition services? People get really confused. And I think if we think of whatever services they need to transition from school to after school life, right? <clears throat> that's a, and that's, it, it seems like it's a very easy, easily grasped concept, but unfortunately it's not. I mean, we struggle across this continuum all the time. It really comes down to that simple definition of, is the youth a student? Is the youth of working age for AVERS programs? Those are the two questions you have to ask. If they're, if they're prior to working age in your state, that's a referral to the state agency for the pre-employment transition services. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, and, and hopefully, hopefully Christine and I haven't <laughs> muddied the waters more <laughs> during this presentation because we're, it, it's one of those things. It's, it's you know, it's folk rehab, it, it's gray. There's no clear answer. Sometimes the mud's less thick in some areas, um, but it's still muddy water, right? So it, it, that guideline is probably the easiest guideline to follow is, is, the, is the individual working age. If they are, is that individual that's working age still a student in school? Then that qualifies for transition services. Mm -hmm. So, and that's for the Avers side. All right. All right. And so since we're talking about examples, here we are. So again, um, there's a lot more examples, um, but we tried not to put too much on a slide. But these are just, again, examples. Um, you may be providing um, a work adjustment skills training. So let's say this, this individual 17 and you want them, uh, or you've been talking with the student and their family and maybe their teachers, you, you know, everyone's kind of on the same page that, yeah, this, this individual needs to uh, kind of learn the soft skills and learn how to get along with others and what's expected on the job. So again, some kind of work adjustment skills training, um, maintenance, whether it's, um, if they're going to a work-based learning experience, so maybe they need to have a, a uniform, transportation, any rehab technology, uh, maybe can controls for a machine that they're gonna use for that summer job experience or uh, job search and placement support. So again, you're putting these services uh, uh, on the individual plan for employment on the IPE and 
and if everyone's in agreement, these are examples of what would be transition services. So again, it's the, the age of that, that individual. So they're in school and qualifies for transition services. So Christine, we got a really good question in here. Um, okay. Anita says, does anyone have their state VR providers on an order of selection? And if so, how is that impacting their ability to provide pre-employment transition services? So uh, how does order of selection impact pre ets and the provision okay. of those services? Well, um, let me, that's a great question. So pre, the provision of pre-employment transition services to students with disabilities who are either potentially eligible um, or eligible, again, is mandated. So the state VR agency must make them available to all students with disabilities who need them. When an agency is on an order of selection um, and, and a state goes on an order of selection because uh, their resources are stressed they, and, and tight, they can only serve uh, so many people at one time. Um, so, you know, the floodgates uh, can't be open because they've, they've got to um, be able to, to uh, put people on a waiting list. So if you're, when you get released off the waiting list, we can serve you. But with the, the law stating that pre-employment transition services must be provided to students with disabilities who are potentially eligible, that means that that student is Again, meets that age range for a student with a disability, they're in school or a recognized education program, and they are either um, on an IEP, a 504 plan, or they have a, a, a diagnosis of other disability. And they don't have to apply for the VR program in order to receive the pre ETS services. Now, the best practice um, is that the state VR agency starts to work with that student because they don't have to apply for VR. And as long as a student is receiving at least one pre-employment transition service, and then they want to apply for the VR program, so they want to put in an application and apply and to be an eligible individual, that means that they would then be subject to the state's order selection. As long as they've started one pre ETS service, they can continue to receive pre-employment transition services until they come off the waiting list and then the counselor can sit with them and um, provide the, uh, they go through the process then of developing the IPE. So that's how, when a state is on an order of selection, you really, you know, you don't want that student um, to sit there on your wait list. And in some states, you know, the kid, a student might graduate and still not be able to have been served. So the practice of starting with pre-employment transition services um, before they even apply is a, a good practice so that then they can apply, they're on the wait list, but they're, they're getting those early set of, of career exploration services, the pre ETS, um, before they come off the waiting list. And I hope that answers the question. I think so. Okay. Great. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some delivery of transition services, how does, what does this look like? How do, how do we work with these uh, youth and the students with disabilities? So, you know, as, as I mentioned um, earlier, you know, the state VR program is now serving more individuals under the age of, of 25. And I think state VR programs and, and probably tribal programs, you've, you've worked with students before in the past, um, but not every counselor is maybe comfortable working with you know teenagers uh, and students and we're going to talk more about working with this population but i'm going to tell you that you know you're going to use your same guiding principles um, uh, for the counseling relationship foundation that you use with adults you know you're going to have be able to show respect 
um, use your active listing skills and work on building um, this relationship first. You know, don't, nothing's more off putting than having that student, you meet with that student and you start talking about the blah, blah, blah of uh, federal regulations. And we're gonna have you fill out this paperwork and I, you know, have you do X, Y, and Z and the student's very confused. And it's not that you're trying to be their best friend but you wanna listen to them, talk with them, um, making sure that um, you understand how to work uh, with youth. And so it's, it's focusing on building a relationship, um, being positive and having that respectful view of them, of the student or the youth and their families. Honoring their full self, emphasizing their strengths, having high expectations for them. And I think that's really um, critical that we don't, you know, define what they can and cannot do. I think that's um, these in the, these students and, and teenagers with disabilities, they're behind the eight ball with their peers without disabilities. So we want to encourage them to explore um, their abilities and strengths and, and uh, preferences. Um, empowering them to make their own choices and being able to advocate for themselves. And, you know, that's a process that if you think back on your own life, um, how long did it take you to do this? You know, there are people we weren't, you know, really wanting to, to stand up and, and speak for ourselves. You know, you kind of feel like, oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing. And, um, and so that's a process that they have to learn. Um, you want to make sure that as you're working with the student that you're involving the family and you're going to ask how do they want to communicate uh, with, with you as a, as a VR counselor? Um, is it through letters? Is it phone calls, um, emails? Um, in this day and age now, we're, we're having to do Zoom meetings and maybe with text. So finding out what they prefer. It's going to be different maybe um, for, from you know, person to person, but I know that I, when we have done webinars um, through the WinTAC and the NTAC, we're finding that many students you know won't respond to an email or a phone call, but if you send them a text, then you get a response. So again, it's just finding out um, what's comfortable uh, and what's preferenced. What's the preference of that that student and that family? Um, I think too, when, when we are working with uh, students and youth, so keeping in mind, and, and we do this when we work with our um, adult population, uh, the same, but again, these are students, youth, so we're looking at helping them identify strengths, preferences, and support needs. You know, the school environment is, is a lot different than, um, of course, what's gonna happen after, after they get out of um, high school. And so taking that time to look at um, exploring what are their support needs that can change over time, right? Um, independent living skills, uh, building social and peer relationships, very important for um, students and youth, giving them those vocational experiences and, and looking at their transportation needs. You know, I, as a kid, and I'm really probably dating myself, but you know, one of the things we always did in the summer is um, we had a, a, a lemonade stand or a Kool-Aid stand, actually. Kool-Aid was cheaper to make than the, the lemonade or, or iced tea, but you know, sell it for 10 cents a cup, you know, out there. That's how my world of work started. Um, Kids with disabilities usually aren't getting these experiences. They're not having the same um, opportunities that their non-disabled peers have. Uh, very important to work on self-advocacy and choice making. So, you know, we wanna be able to em empower them and allow them to practice, you know, 
being an advocate for themselves, which is why, you know, having them attend um, and speak up and be a part of their um, IEP and of course the IPE process is how we, we give them those experiences. And then, um, you know, it's not our goals for this student, but what is it that they want? And it, it takes, you know, I may tell you today, I wanna be uh, working in, the, in an animal shelter. And then next week I tell you, I wanna be a gamer. And then after that, I tell you, I wanna be uh, a uh, blogger <laughs> because I've, I've been watching, uh, you know, a YouTube video or, or TikTok um, and that's okay. It's, it's looking at exploring those things and, you know, not for us not to shoot down those dreams, but when they come up with some of these things that they wanna do, you know, ask them, you know, we use our, our good counseling skills and we say, Hmm. Okay. Tell me more about that. How do you, how do you want to accomplish that? So it's, it's again, uh, finding out and helping them explore. And I'll shut up Wayne and you can talk. You know, I, I agree with you. And I really like um, where you're going with that. We, especially with this slide, when I look at the, the holistic approach to working with students and youth, one of the things that I found most uh, disturbing in the Avers world was that a lot of our youth uh, don't have hope. They ha they can't see past 16 because that's when all of their family members have gotten pregnant and became moms. And so they left school they, and, and that's just what it is. Or they're stuck in a cycle of, of domestic violence and abuse at home. And that's just how you, you know, that's just the way it is. They, they can't see past that, that, that screen of, of trauma or, um, whatever is blocking there. And sometimes it's the parental units not having that experience either, not knowing that there's something outside of, of uh, you know, breaking horses and getting busted up and drinking every night. And, and you know, that, that's, that's okay too, but it's, it's something that we as advocates have to um, support. And so when I see the holistic approach, I, I really see that it's our, it's our opportunity to reach out to these these youth in school uh, and students. Um, and one of the nice things, if you're if you're providing these transition services, like over a summer, maybe you're doing a, a summer week long uh, transitions camp, so to speak, or or presentation or activity, the other youth in the community can still observe and maybe even participate because of the group services aspect that we can now provide. So the platform for outreach is huge at this point when we're working with the students and the youth that I think we can, we can start seeing some big impact on, on how, they, how they look to the future. And that to me is the, is the biggest part of transition services showing them that there's opportunities outside of that. And, and in, I know in the uh, couple of slides up next, we're gonna talk about how that is also important for families because the families don't have that same experience and knowledge uh, that a lot of us have in this field. So that's all I wanted to add. Yeah, so that's, that's great. And I, I think from, uh, we have a couple of things in the chat now just mention them so we can uh, move on. But, um, you know, someone is, uh, Amanda has talked about, um, she really gets a referral at age 16. She's getting them when they're 18 and about to graduate. And it's kind of like, oh, wow. Maybe if uh, the student hasn't had much um, exploration of, of careers at, at 18, they're, they've lost some, some uh, critical time there because they're having, to, they're getting out of high school. They got to make a decision on what to do. So, you know, the, being able to um, work together, state VR and, and tribal VR and education and uh, giving students and youth, you know, early and often, you know, these experiences that kind of build and layer and stack upon one another, it just gives a stronger knowledge base for uh, when you do receive them, you know, they come into your office 
um, and they're you're writing the I, uh, the IPE, so that um, you know it, it's just a, a much smoother process and more enriching for the individual. So I think we can go on to the next slide. So this is the holistic approach to working with families and, and parents. You know, uh, I think that we are, we are going to be living in this pandemic situation for, for some more time. Um, and I think even if life goes back to more quote unquote normal, we are still going to see that services will be provided virtually, um, especially because it can help reach um, maybe more individuals. But whether we do it virtually or in person, we really want to help um, motivate the students and the families to remain engaged in services. And this is, this is really becoming hard for many, for many of us, even as professionals. Um, I don't know about you all, but this week I've had a really hard time just remembering what day of the week it is. And I think the longer we uh, quarantine or we have to stay home and, and work from home, um, we, we get affected. But you know, we want to be able to prioritize what we're asking of the families because they get overwhelmed. You know, oftentimes I think, um, and I, I don't have the chat box up, but one of the last comments um, that someone pointed out was they attended a YTAC webinar about uh, runaway youth or homeless youth and, and juvenile justice um, involved youth and and again you know families that are in poverty or um, are they're struggling um, they're overwhelmed families moms dads every the, the whole family they get it very overwhelmed with what's happening so you want to uh, make sure that you're not um, giving them too much information at one time uh, finding ways to talk directly to the families. So maybe that means, um, again, Zoom meetings. Maybe if you are meeting with them in person, you're doing that at a school event, transition fair, or a, um, something where the family's been invited. Making sure that you have these regular times to connect and touch base. Um, even if it's just like, again, you're sending a text, asking everyone how they're doing, do they have any questions of you? Um, being able to connect families with other families. Peer support, whether you're a student, whether you're a family, whether you're a professional, is just so powerful. Um, and also celebrating successes, not only for the students, but also for their families. Um, because parents don't often get pats on the back either, right? They're, they're trying to... Some of them have been laid off or some of them were working two or three jobs um, and they're, they're not home. So acknowledging their struggles and, and just saying, hey, hang in there, you're doing a great job with what you've got. So as we continue to look at this, um, I think it's important to always upfront be able to discuss and reinforce employment expectations is, you know, for oftentimes, maybe a family doesn't have any employment expectations of their son or daughter because they're, they're saying, oh, they're too severely disabled. Um, and I, I think helping them uh, be, when you keep a family involved, letting them uh, watch their student experience a work-based learning experience. We've heard from families say, my God, my, my son or my daughter has, they come home now and they're just chatty Kathy. They're talking and telling me everything about what happened. Whereas they didn't have that kind of enthusiasm maybe about um, math class or, or some other um, programming at the school. Always reinforcing uh, that that's a partnership. So you're not, you know, you're all in this together. Being mindful of diverse cultural backgrounds is very important. Don't assume, um, you know, if you 
if you are unclear about something when you're working with a family and the student, make sure that you ask. Um, and encourage those, those parents um, to be uh, involved in decision making, um, but having the uh, expectations of your son or daughter could, could achieve this. And, and let's try this out. Again, when you're giving the student a voice, you're being able to align the motivations and goals of education um, and VR with the motivations and goals of those families. And uh, as we talked, mentioned earlier, just maybe asking the right questions so that you're getting the family or the student to, to talk, you know, what, what is their vision uh, for that student's future? What are their concerns? How can you address it? And if your state has a, uh, and they should all have a parent training center um, as a VR agency or a tribal agency, I encourage you to get in contact with them and have a, a working relationship. It's not about you having to do all the work, but taking advantage of other partners um, who can help you in serving students and families. Okay. So where do we start? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> well, the, at the beginning, right? It's hard to start in the middle. So we strive for positive working relationships um, with the local schools and special ed programs. Uh, I know a lot of the, the schools are very difficult to get into uh, in our service areas. Um, I know in a lot of states, we're still struggling with the state VR programs in that relationship. But that's really where we start, going in and, and making those contacts, establishing those, those relationships. And then we also need to look at other adult agency service providers in our area. So uh, working with you know, maybe TANF or something like that. Review and update your AVERS collaborative agreement with the state VR agency. Um, we found that in a lot of these uh, MOUs or, or uh, cooperative agreements that are out there that we haven't um, seen transition guidelines put into place yet. So in, in addressing those uh, guidelines, that's gonna help you set the, the ground rules or initiate that process of, of providing these services in a collaborative sense. And if you have any questions or need clarification, please contact your RSA project officers to provide that guidance. We also encourage focusing on collaboration with the partners to ensure that eligible students receive all transition services. So that goes back to the first bullet of, of developing that positive relationship with the, the state VR program in your area. And having, that, having the ability to, to share information and exchange uh, thoughts or, or have a discussion about the services being provided to that individual and how, how we can get those services in a um, more consistent fashion. So, because I know a lot of times in the, in, the, in the tribal schools, the state representation is hit and miss. We might see them once a month. We might see them once every six months. We might be lucky to see them once a year. Uh, so it, it really, it, that consistency is, is vital in, in moving this forward. Exactly. So the role of the AVERS programs for working age students in transition, what are we supposed to do? And this was some of the chat box stuff we had going on. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go back to what the AVERS proposal is. What did you write in your grant? How did you identify transition services in your grant? Provide outreach and orientation activities um, about the AVERS uh, transition services with local schools and students with disabilities in your service area. So holding, uh, you know, if, if the school has a like an employer's day or something like that, having a booth just to get the information out there. The disability awareness, some, some areas have weeks, some areas have months, uh, and they have community fairs or you know, whatever, whatever events take place. Have a booth there explaining those services. 
develop a relationship with a local school and the special education department. Again, uh, from the previous slide, developing that positive relationship, allowing that communication to take place. If we, if we aren't able to identify the youth or students in need from the school, we aren't gonna be able to capture uh, the ability to serve them. So we have to have the people that are with the eyes on these, these youth reaching out to us, giving us that information. We need that referral source. So developing that, that um, relationship is vital. Engage in conversations with the school personnel about ways that we can be involved with transition activities. Um, again, you heard me say some of this stuff before, career awareness fairs, transition planning meetings, that type of thing. Being present at an IEP meeting no way implies any commitment to service provision on the AVERS program part. But being at the table allows you to have an advocate's voice in helping that student move forward. And so going back to where we discuss the, the loss of hope or uh, short-sightedness, nearsightedness um, of the future, this is where we start to change that trajectory uh, or trajectory of that, of that youth. We have the ability to, to create a platform of hope, which then leads to change at this point. And, and those bullets there, uh, Wayne, actually apply also to the state VR program. You know, it, it's all about, um, you know, being present, being involved, doing what you say you're going to do. So if you tell the school, hey, I, I will be uh, able to attend all your career awareness fairs or transition planning meetings or whatever, then you keep your word and you go. The more people see you and you're, you're talking, you're communicating, they're going to know you as, oh, that's the, the counselor, that's that uh, staff person that helps get, um, get, get you a job or, or get you ready for work or works with, gets you accommodations. I mean, people, you start educating uh, the school personnel, the, the students and the parents. All right, so uh, just to keep you up to date, Christine, we got like 10 minutes, so we're gonna push on through here. <laughs> we also, uh, again, we, I just talked about this. I just mentioned individualized education plan, uh, transition meeting, bring along AVERS informational material, discuss AVERS and eligibility criteria for services. Uh, what is the process? And so Jamie here is, has, uh, Emmanuel has created a VR process uh, outline that's really handy. And once it's published, it'll be available for you guys to utilize. That's a great example of, of talking about the VR process. Developing a relationship with local schools and providers to create awareness about AVERS. You know, one of the things I hear a lot is that the community doesn't know what we do. They're, we're just the tires program or the gas program um, in a lot of communities because that's, that's what they see and that's what they hear. So getting out and providing that education of that we're deeper than that. We're here for, you know, uh, helping people gain employment. We're here for rehabilitation needs. That, that is, is a, a critical point in providing these services. And then serve as a role in connecting the school and the student with a disability to ser services to the state. So if, if those relationships with your state liaison are solid, you can, you can start the referral process for them. You can, you can provide the information to the family and help develop that sense of, of trust and comfort that allows them to move forward with that transitions uh, person at the state level. Because as we know, all know that a lot of our, our consumers in our service areas still have that distrust of state personnel. So being that, um, that mediator, so to speak, is important. All right, back to you. Well, we uh, told you earlier that we would look at how, how do you build a transition team? How does it What's this, uh, what does it look like? Well, it starts at the state level. So from the top, you're gonna have um, interagency agreements and that would be um, 
an agreement that's with the Department of Education, your State Department of Education, your State VR agency, and Tribal VR. And these are actually in the, required in the regulations. Um, so I, I won't go through those citations, but um, again, it's that formal agreement that says how we're going to work together, how we're going to serve mutual um, consumers or, or mutual individuals. But when we take it down to the local level, so you have this agreement at the state level, locally, it's your local school personnel. So your special ed um, teachers, maybe there's a transition coordinator at the school, uh, your local tribal counselor, your local VR counselor. You're gonna involve the student and parent or guardian. You may even have other community service providers um, such as a developmental disabilities administration or a mental health um, authority um, in your, your area. So again, when you get everyone at the table, you're then able to look at, you know, coordinating services for students, um, having that effective communication so that everyone's on the same page, being able to understand and support individual student goals. And that all those services get aligned and that you're leveraging um, resources from each other so that there's this seamless transition process for a student. So, you know, they don't need to know, oh, state VR is going to pay for this uh, pre-ed service, and then tribal VR is going to do uh, this under the IPE, and then this other community. You know, they, as long as it's seamless and you're all in con talking to each other and, and providing these things, and that's the key for successful transition. And so since we also know that uh, a lot of people are visual, we wanted to share um, this, this, this image. So employment is our goal. That's what, we, that's what we're seeking. At the end result, as we all know, in our IPE, we have to have a goal. And that goal has to be employment. It can't be the services to get to employment. It has to be the employment that we're entering into. And so we have employment as the end goal. We have the student with a disability. Um, so we have the school that initiates the, the other, or the, the IDEA support. We have AVERS programs, we have state VR, and then we have some other stakeholders and they all put into the student and then they bring that forward to the employment. So we're all in, our, our end goal is always to support this individual into employment. Well, who should be on that transition team? You wanna make sure that you have people who represent the knowledge and skills domains that are essential to promoting that full inclusion in the high school environment and having that foundation for that um, student to have a successful transition to adult life. It could be, you, you may have some unconventional individuals maybe that are uh, involved in this transition team, but at probably at a minimum, it's your special ed teacher, the tribal VR counselor, the VR counselor, and also the student and the family members. And give them equal voice and, and, and have times, um, again, for them to be involved. So the coordination and collaboration, um, uh, I think nuts and bolts even, we may have to have another webinar, Wayne. I, I think it's probably a good idea. All right. Um, resources from NTAC, the collaborative. Um, you will see here that I've said that uh, we're going to have a new website. <laughs> the grant started October 1st and it's currently under construction, but you can access the um, transitionta.org or WinTAC, um, the pre employment transition services topic area for a number of resources. Um, and these links are live. So when you uh, get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to click on those links and, and uh, get some information. But we have a listserv. Um, and anytime you have questions or you want technical assistance, there is an email address there. Um, again, 
visit these uh, transitionta.org and the WinTech uh, pre-employment sites because number of resources, I know I saw in the chat box, um, someone was asking about some services or resources for providing services to students and uh, you could get lost looking for them. There's so much. So um, just wanted to throw that out there and uh, we'll have a new website shortly. Okay, so save the date time. Um, we have a couple webinars coming up next. We have the external applicant consumer evaluations used for eligibility determination and IPE development. That's coming up January 20th. Uh, then our talking circle where we talk about transitions and the external uh, evaluations. So we'll have an open discussion and questions and, and just the talking circles have really uh, come to light and I like and enjoy hearing all the feedback and hearing the discussions that take place. That's February 3rd. So save the date there. And of course, now we come to the part where I beg for you guys' attention. So please go to the survey at, at the link and John just put it in the box. Uh, take the survey, tell us what you thought of our presentation. We also wanna know what the next presentation is that you're, you're interested in. So please do that. And since we're in the new year, we wanna make sure that you can contact us through all of these different things. We have our website, we have um, our email, and then thanks to Winona, we have a great Facebook presence now. Please follow us in all those different areas. As usual, we are available all the time for questions. Please reach out to us at AverTAC. And um, Christine's information is in here also. So if you have questions for her, please get a hold of her. That's right. Or Wayne can get a hold of me too. So I welcome uh, answering any questions. Um, yeah, just I think this is a, a great avenue here to, to start this discussion and just learning how to work together. And we we'll be offering the CRC credit. So please uh, contact Jamie if you need those uh, hours, 1.5 hours today. And that's in the chat. Yes, Jamie Emanuel at nau.edu. Oh, jamie.emanuel at nau.edu. Thanks everybody, stay safe. I'm glad to see so many people on here. Yes, thank you. thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Happy New Year. Thank you. Susie, how did you stay quiet for an hour and a half? <laughs> yeah, Susie. Bite my lips. Hello, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things I have wanted to say throughout all of this. We've been working in the state of Oregon. We had a mandate 11 years ago, an executive order to shut down all the sheltered workshops. And yep. so we um, escalated quickly into how to work with that group as well as working with um, the Prius that were coming out. And Keith Ozel and Heather Lindsay were very, very much a part of this exactly. um, Prius piece. So I have been working in this for quite a few years. And um, we were one of the first pilot teams with the Employment First team. So we <clears> have, um, for 11 years, our partners, because we're rural and we're small, have been the same partners. So um, we are in the schools. We are working with um, all of the groups that need to be informed and worked with. And I love the fact that everyone's getting all of this information and, and being able to start that. But my question has always been, because my grant, um, and I talked to Wayne about this, and my grant always states that I serve 18 and above, but we've always done the outreach, been a great partner state, in fact, we have a part, uh, meeting later this month with um, a tribal student that is not within our realm because we don't know them. They've moved to the area is the only reason they're out of our realm. So we didn't know the student, but the state, they went to the state and the state now is bringing us into the high school with the YTP program. And we will be on board with the student from, from the start letting them know about tribal services along with our advocacy and stuff. So we don't provide service until someone turns 18 because in our grant it stays 18 and above. 
we talk about transition, we talk about youth in um, our outreach activities, and that's how we've, we've provided activities over the last 11 years and continue at this point. Um, my part is we are a small community and we know that numbers are increasing within our schools and that we will have a lot of new um, participants once they hit 18. But then how do we look at um, maybe lowering our age to 16 and do that in an honoring way that doesn't take those funds away from the adults that we're serving currently? Because state and schools are responsible until 18. I mean, it's just kind of how it is and, and the way it's been laid out. So is it beneficial to my program to really now roll back my age criteria to 16. And as um, a friend of mine once told me, it would be like herding cats until they were 18 because of processes. Anyone can come in the door instantly and maybe not be in all the other parts. And then you're just kind of really not really in that same piece as you are with your, um, with your adults that you're getting ready to for the employment part. So we see the value of our youth. I mean, don't underestimate what I'm saying is I'm not valuing what our youth do, but I value what my partners do at this point. You know, within for the me, pre piece, and then within um, working all of those pieces, we're in every step of the way. I mean, we're part of every process that the state VR is doing with these students and with the schools. I mean, we're, we've got a really solid partnership going. So um, I don't know if I want to monkey that system at this point. <laughs> because I know at 18, they're coming in. I mean, we, we yeah. set the foundation very well that they know their transition piece is at 18 and then they will be um, making the choice of dual services or state or VR. So they know that all of that, their families are, are ingrained in the fact that we're here and the state and schools are doing this until 18 and then we move forward. So everything you said today, um, is, is spot on, as you know, but um, it's great to hear it again as we go through and, and I refresh myself from the journey of 11 years to this. So, um, yeah. so Susie, for me, it, it always goes, as a director, it goes back to this, right? I mean, if, if you decide to look at how you're, cha or change what you're doing now, Mm -hmm. does it increase your budget so if i'm writing that application it does it allow me to have an increase in my budget then i might consider changing it if it's working right now and you're documenting it it's not broken That's how I why think you, too. yeah why it's not <laughs> broken why are you going to fix it exactly and i know dollars are tight i mean for all the programs dollars are tight and so do i increase my budget and then have to look at maybe um taking that money and it doesn't benefit the way, because I've got a benefit now, and it doesn't benefit others that may need those dollars. You know, where does that, where does that come from? Right. So, yeah, I, I've, I've looked at it at that way as well. Um, it's something that's not broken. We don't need to fix. And we've got great um, strides in this at this point. Uh, Susie? Yes. Uh, this is Lee. Hi, Lee. Um, just a couple of observations. Um, one is, is to do your homework uh, in terms of collecting data for the age group that could benefit from transition services so that you do identify the need and determine if the, if the need is great for you to consider including this population in your current or your new grant proposal. Um, as Wayne pointed out, um, should that be the course you pursue, make sure that you uh, increase your, your annual budget to provide services for this target population. Um, the other thing that we have seen uh, in, the AVERS grant proposal is separating the adult population from the transition youth in terms of developing goals and objectives so that they're not mixed. And that makes it for easier tracking 
-hmm. And as you pointed out with the dwindling uh, resources, um, perhaps at this time, um, you want to pay more attention to uh, what, what the AVERS program's focus should be in terms of priority um, uh, population and in the special application uh, requirements under item C, it does specify that priority in the delivery of VR services will be given to those American Indians who are most significantly disabled. So that um, while you do follow the six eligibility criteria, you might um, start to share this information during your outreach and orientation to potential consumers that while you may receive a significant number of applicants, um, just to go according to the prescribed requirements that the individuals who are most significantly disabled will be served first. Um, and, and that may also um, help you uh, streamline your services for this uh, particular group of individuals that you plan to serve first. Um, but, but if you were to include the transition youth in your current um, proposal, um, just keep in mind that if you do have a specific goal just for the adult population that you can't uh, change your current goal without getting prior approval from your RSA project officer. And you may be aware of that. Thank you, Lee. And yeah, I'm, I, I am aware of that. I, uh, Oregon, under this executive order that we're under, it's a Lane versus Brown piece. Um, we had to be very, very specific in, in our target populations and the servings that we're doing. So um, in Oregon, every person will work. It's not, you know, you, one or the other. It's every, every individual has the right to integrated services and integrated employment in the state of Oregon. So um, we have worked with that and, and that population is more significantly disabled. And we have okay. um, got those pieces in line and, and done all of those. So um, I, again, thank everybody for you know, all of your knowledge and sharing. And I think these are important topics that we get out to everyone. And I um, am writing my, well, I've written my grant, but I'm refreshing it to get it mm -hmm. sent in this round. And um, because we got kicked out in August because of the waiver in COVID. So I'm getting ready to do that again. And then I was, um, that's why I was asking the question about the services under 18, mm -hmm. because I know some of my partners are serving under 18 and I have read their grants and it doesn't say that they're doing that. So I was just wondering kind of how that was rolling yes, out for yes, them. Yes, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see that as an option for me. Yes, uh, I will stand another, on the line, but not cross it. Yes, uh, another benefit of gathering and reviewing data for the transition population is, in your in your grant proposal, you can indicate that you're already looking at future cons consumers coming through. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there would always be a need for VR services on your mm -hmm. uh, respective reservation, whether or not you're receiving federal funds or. Mm -hmm. There may be a time where the tribe may need to um, kick in something to um, provide all eligible uh, consumers with services. Yeah, we um, we put that that data in our grant proposal, and um, you know we look from kindergarten, well, actually from Head Start through twelfth grade and what our projected focus might be with um, people coming into our program. So we're using that data already. Okay, to great. To show that there will be a need, not only in um, identified populations that we know of in adults, but also 
here are these kids coming and we know that there's another group of kids coming and yes the yes. projection is going to be forever you know that's we're always going to have a need because of people um coming to school and now we're starting to identify yes so great. those pieces yeah um mm -hmm. those are real important pieces that we need to do okay so amanda i really like uh well, your, your comment, it, Amanda's just saying that uh, they just say students in transition and don't give mm -hmm. a specific age, which I, yeah, I really I like, like that. that approach. Um, thank you. All right, guys, we got other webinars to get to, so I, I hate to cut everybody off. The after show is always where the, the good stuff comes from, it seems like. <laughs> Now to zoom out, to zoom back in. Yeah, zoom out, <laughs> zoom in. Okay, uh, I'll take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Amanda. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks,